third panel of the day, and it's a panel that we've had every year. It's the uh, Biopharma Industry Investment Outlook panel. And this year, we have a moderator that, re that, is, that requires no introduction. His name is Sam Waxall, who's the guru of biotech. We typically have Sam sit in the panels, but Sam has so much to say that that we often don't get to the other panelists. And so we took a different tack this year and we asked Sam to actually moderate the panel so that he can, he can bring everybody else into the conversation. So Sam, with that, this is your cue. I now hand it over to you. Thank you, Andy. And uh, that was a way to get me not to speak at all and just introduce people. So we have a great panel today. We have both industry players uh, and uh, players from, from uh, uh, the investment community. And I'm going to introduce everybody so we don't take time in them introduce themselves. And so we have, we're very lucky to have uh, Chris Wiebacher, who's the uh, CEO and president of Biogen. Uh, Chris has uh, been an industry mainstay as well as an investment mainstay. And uh, uh, was, of course, the uh, CEO of Sanofi and really grew that in a, a great way. We also have today Daphne Zohar, who's the uh, uh, CEO and president of PureTech and has done very interesting and important things in our industry. We have Steve Knight and Dr. Steve Knight is at F Prime. It was at uh, Fidelity Bio, but he, he didn't want to be associated with them. So he changed the name of uh, his venture group. And then we have uh, uh, Rajiv Cole who uh, uh, is uh, uh, known to all of us as being the big investment player at Fidelity uh, uh, Investments. And we have Teresa Say, who is the uh, uh, chairman, a chairwoman of Sinobiopharmaceuticals, the second largest uh, uh, company in, uh, a second largest pharma company in China. And we have a couple of others that will be joining us uh, during the question and answer period. So this is uh, uh, my cue to ask questions. And I'll start with Chris V. Bacher. And, uh, you know, Chris has now uh, uh, done uh, a transition to the dark side. The dark side's really the investors. So he's not come to the dark side. He's come to the innovative side. So Chris, uh, you were at Santa Fe. You changed Santa Fe's uh, 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 uh innovation direction, you bought Genzyme and did a number of other things. Tell us uh, how you view the world now that you've become the CEO of a large biotech company. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I, I like being where, where I am now at, uh, at Biogen. I think it's a sweet spot between startup biotech and uh, big pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, there's there's a lot more focus, a lot more agility in the company the size of Biogen, um, and and yet we still have global scale. We have affiliates around the world and can commercialize a product that way. Um, we're a lot more focused, certainly. Uh, you know, Sanofi was a big sprawling uh, organization. Um, here, we're really focused on on neuroscience and some rare diseases, um, and you know, in, in an organization like this you have a much closer um, contact with with everybody in the organization uh, and 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 also I think from a stock market point of view you've got an awful lot more ability to move the needle you, you know a billion dollars will move the needle for a biogen it, you know it doesn't really move the needle for a large pharmaceutical company so uh, it's great to be back with a team and a, and a particularly such a mission oriented uh, company like biogen it's going after they have a lot of pride in going after diseases um, that nobody else wants to touch. That's, uh, that, and that, by the way, is a real big difference between biotech and, and big pharma. So thank you. And Daphne, um, and, you know, we've talked a lot and the world's changed uh, uh, for even uh, smaller biotech companies like yours. And you have uh, a goal in really trying to figure out uh, uh, getting money in a non-dilutive fashion, new ways to look at uh, uh, the industry vis-a-vis -vis the innovative products that you generate. How do you balance and use products and uh, uh, approaches like that 
for uh, uh, capital. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So um, at PureTech, we've now invented and advanced about 27 new therapeutics and therapeutic candidates, of which two have gone all the way from inception to FDA approval, and a third, CAR-XT, that's being advanced by Karuna, is filing soon. And I think one of the things that that we've been able to do, which is um, is beneficial, is to be able to generate non-dilutive capital. So we've been able to generate about seven hundred and eighty million in non-dilutive funding. And what that means is that we haven't had to raise money in the capital markets in over five years. Uh, that has its advantages and its disadvantages, which we can talk about later. But I think in the current environment, a lot of companies are looking for creative approaches to uh, advancing their pipelines uh, as we get through it. And I hopefully we'll get through it soon. Great. Uh, and Rajiv, You've been the the sort of elephant in the room for virtually every biotech, pharma, every kind of investment opportunity there is. And the world's changing. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, you could have uh, uh, two uh, uh, anybody's uh, move forward in a deal and people would invest in it and the stock would go, would go up. What's the difference now? And I don't think you've changed a lot, but how's the investment world changing? Thanks, Sam. I, I, <clears throat> I feel much better investing in the current environment. And um, I'd echo some of the comments made from last year as well. And the current environment is one of high uncertainty, um, cheaper, and in some cases, extremely cheap stock prices in the biotech industry particularly, which I don't view as necessarily economically sensitive. And in a period of great innovation, as we know, and, and the possibility of some real breakthroughs in fundamental science and translation in the clinic, my approach has been long-term, fundamental-driven. And so in the framework of a very favorable valuation setup, about a third of the industry was trading at, at below cash, a historical low, even low at one point in the last 12 months uh, than it was at post the dot-com bubble crash. It's really set up a very exciting moment to be a stock picker. Uh, you know, as we know, this has always been a stock picker's industry. Most drugs fail, but the few work, work really well. They go from becoming the worst businesses in the world to the best businesses in the world. And, or you need a handful of them, maybe a dozen of them really every decade, you know, great companies like Gilead and others, top biotech companies in the last decade that we know of, they go up 20 fold, 50 fold if you buy them early and you get the fundamentals right. So my focus continues to be uh, doing the bottoms up fundamental stock picking, doing the work uh, and making sure we can manage risk through this period. But overall, my excitement and enthusiasm for the sector continues to be high, particularly because the innovation is exciting and the valuation framework continues to remain tough for a lot of companies that need capital. It gives us an opportunity to try and recapture these companies. And I'm hopeful that in the next three to five years, as the macro economy settles down, the uh, fundamentals will emerge and people will care about that. Um, and so that, that continues to be approach and the overall tenor, my thought in this moment is quite positive. Right. Well, that's, that's important. Uh, and hearing it from you, know, you the funds it, are it is almost 20% year over year as of May 1st, you know, yeah, amazingly so, panel, you know which is I'm sort of like, you know, kind of surprising to me too, given how, how depressed everything is. We haven't, we haven't even emerged from the depressed state as yet. So I'm going to keep my fingers yeah, crossed. So again, again, it's it's a tough industry. You got to get the fundamentals right. There's disappointments everywhere. So you, you got to be able to manage risk through that and be well capitalized. Well, you know, that's actually a perfect lead in uh, for some things I'm going to ask uh, Steve Knight, because I am a firm believer that uh, about 95 percent uh, 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 of the uh, uh, startups out there that venture invests in are garbage or me too uh, stuff that uh, is no longer interesting. So I don't know how many more CAR T companies are going to be established or how many more companies in immuno oncology 
but I find it to be the height of absurdity. And I know Rajiv uh, is very careful not to jump into that. So I'm going to ask Steve, uh, what does venture look at to be innovative? Because I actually am one of the people on the, the planet that thinks venture lives in paradigms, and that's the antithesis of innovation. <laughs> well, thank you, Sam, for that setup. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in this era of uh, uh, um, partial truths and disinformation, I, I, I realize that, you know, you have to you have to counter every single statement and make sure you don't let it, let it go unanswered for just for the record. Um, we did not change our name because we, we, we wanted to do <laughs> fidelity. It was just to reflect the fact that uh, there was confusion in the, in the market with, with Rajiv, who does all of the wonderful investing and his group and, and other funds and our group, which as you point out is on the venture side and fidelity is, our largest LP. So that ended up being an important thing. So just 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 point of record. But um, uh, but you're, and, you know, well I, I actually knew that I was uh, just yeah, trying no, to I know you were just trying to poke me. Yeah. And so I would, <laughs> I would say I, in terms of uh, venture, and I, I think Rajiv is right, I, we don't invest in public companies. So public companies right now are, I, I think, there's lots of opportunity, and in part, you have to do the hard work if you're a public investor, which we're not, of separating the wheat from the the chaff because not everything that's down is uh, is, is good. There's some that are down for a reason. I think that um, in terms of where we are right now, it, we were fortunate starting out 20 years ago with maybe a little bit of insight and and a, a little and maybe a lot of luck choosing rare disease. And um, FoldRx, which developed Tefambitis for TTR, was our, really our first investment. Um, but that set the stage for looking at, Rajiv said, the fundamentals. And what we liked about rare disease, or, or what it was called orphan disease back then, was the fact that, one, the unmet medical need was, was large. Um, we were really curing patients, which certainly I'm um, old enough, as you noted before, um, uh, with the color of my hair, <laughs> to, when I was in medical school, um, there were things that we cured, but not a lot of things that we cured. And and therapeutics was a, 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 a more akin to, in some ways, uh, you know, the way I played with my chemistry set, you know, in the, in middle school, shaking a lot of things in and hoping for the best. And, and uh, that's obviously a rhetorical overstatement, but I think that what has happened, and it started with some of the focus on genetic diseases, is, is that we are really understanding, which is what we liked. The other part is I want to know the molecular mechanism of a disease, and I want to know the target, and I want to actually be able to test the target. I think that one thing that, and hopefully those insights into rare diseases will lead to, to um, uh, uh, therapeutics that have more broad appeal. And TTR is a great example of that. You know, the original disease was only, you know, 10,000 patients worldwide. And if you followed, you know, 5,000 of, of whom were in Portugal, and if you followed missionaries and, uh, um, and Jesuit priests from the, you know, 15th and 16th century, you could find everybody else. But afterwards, you know, the cardiac uh, manifestation of the disease is a much bigger population. And so that, that, is, uh, that required a lot more capital. In terms of, so I am, in terms of the overall um, uh, sentiment, I am very um, uh, excited about this decade. I, I really believe that life sciences and medicine is to the 21st century what physics was to the 20th century. And in, in that, I think the most exciting things are going to happen, you know, large language models aside. Um, uh, but you know, there are lots of, there are some headwinds. So I think that pricing, for instance, especially in some of these smaller diseases, trying to, um, I, I would say, break through the proper noise of really bad practices that the pharma industry and the biopharma industry has had around pricing um, so that um, uh, drugs that, that are really providing an unmet medical need and we're really rewarding innovation those are some of the challenges, but I, 
in general, I'm, I'm, I am very excited and, and uh, I don't think prices in the private market uh, have properly uh, reset uh, as they have in the public market, but that will come in due time. So. Well, that, by the way, you're absolutely, I, I happen to agree with you. It's just uh, not always that easy. I mean, I remember when <clears throat> I was at Case Western Reserve Medical School, since I'm an immunologist, they were only talking about uh, T cells and B cells then. We now know the immune system is much more complex than that. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating time in medicine. You're absolutely right. So that brings me to a question again for Chris Wiebacher. Uh, um, Steve just talked about pricing. And we see now uh, with Lily's phase three data, which is different and in a different uh, area that, than biogen's work. Uh, but nevertheless, if everybody that uh, uh, is going to be treated, everybody with Alzheimer's that would be treated with these antibodies because they're just desperate, even though uh, I believe there is only an incremental uh, 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 change, um, will bankrupt uh, Medicare immediately. So what are we going, and, and I know that uh, indeed we'll save some time of people, some of them sitting uh, in nursing homes or, or getting uh, uh, their, their uh, faces dabbed with a, uh, a napkin to stop the drool. So we'll save that money. But this is a big moment in a world where there is real desperation uh, uh, for these patients. What are we going to do about uh, uh, pricing? And how do you look at incremental changes versus changes that are big? Because you're now in a universe with Biogen and uh, 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 others are, are in that same world where we're not looking at a cure yet for AD, we are looking at an incremental change. Well, first I, I will argue that it's not an incremental change. Um, it certainly, uh, if you look at the, the studies that have done, this is the first breach in the wall against Alzheimer's you know, since Alois Alzheimer started looking at, at patients with autopsies um, and looking at the plaques 100 years ago. Um, and this is the first study that really demonstrated the benefit of reducing those amyloid plaques on, on cognitive function. Now, we know that actually uh, we're probably not treating the patients at the right time. Um, and, and so as we get blood diagnostics and can go earlier before there's too much neuronal death, um, you're going to see an increased benefit, and you're going to see a benefit over time. And and so I, I, I would I would argue that uh, when you look at also activities of daily life where caregivers see specific changes in, in people's behavior, their ability to participate in the community and look after themselves, that this is actually a, a breakthrough uh, therapy. That said, the point is still valid on, on costs. Um, and I think there's there's two points I guess I would make. One is, is that as a society, I think we're going to have to do a better job of picking um, uh, and choosing where we're going to spend the money. Um, you know, 75% of healthcare budgets go to chronic diseases, many of which are, are, uh, are preventable. So we're spending an awful lot of money where actually behavioral change and, and different diets, different exercise regimes could actually save an awful lot of money. So personally, I think we're going to need to save our scarce resources for those people who have illnesses for which they can't really do anything. Um, you know, you can't help it if you get cancer, you can't help it if you get Alzheimer's, and I think we're gonna really have to help people there. Um, do we need to spend as much as a society on, on weight loss drugs um, when uh, there is another solution which is much cheaper, for example? Um, obviously, the world is not a rational place and you can go broke um, thinking that it is. Um, but, and, and as a result, I think, you know, there's still going to be pressure on prices. I, I, I think we're going to see over the next 10 to 15 years things that look a lot more like Europe um, on pricing. And, and I think the response that we as an industry have to have are, is twofold. One is the, the bar for innovation is going to continue to grow. Um, to your point, how many CAR-T companies do we need? How many PD-1s do we need? Um, that's not going to fly in tomorrow's world. We'll have to... to 
spend our research on actually um, uh, upping the, the, the ante on, on innovation. And the second is we're going to have to get a lot better at, at healthcare economics and really being able to assess the economic uh, value and not just the medical value of our, of our, our new medicines. So I think there is a, a number of things, but I think, you know, we, we can't afford not to treat Alzheimer's and, and rare diseases and oncology but I think there are perhaps some other areas where through preventative measures, we could actually save the, the healthcare system, the money that's needed to fund those, those uh, catastrophic illnesses. I, I, I can't agree with you more. And there is so much waste in our system of payers, especially in the U.S. And everything from unnecessary PBMs to uh, people going to an emergency room with a cold and getting charged. $25,000 for uh, uh, that. So we have a healthcare system that's broken that needs to be fixed. And the last place that we need to fix it is inhibiting innovation. So I'll go back to Daphne, uh, who tries very hard to use innovation in the way she moves things forward and tell me, and one, how are you looking at innovation as a biotech person, really biotechy. And secondly, how do you use that in a creative way to uh, move products forward? So the way I look at innovation is, are we bringing an innovation, an innovation, um, a new solution for patients? So are we able to change the lives of patients? And for me, that's innovation, if you're able to do that well. And one thing that we're excited about, that I'm personally excited about, is the idea that one could build on work that's been done before, where there's been already a new modality, a new target that's advanced to the point of getting some initial signals of human efficacy, but then it had some drawbacks um, that were not, uh, that looked, they seemed insurmountable at the time that the drug was developed. We have new technologies and tools now to un lock important new classes of medicine uh, and through innovation and bring those those new classes to patients. So I'm personally very excited about that. And Rajiv, what do you think about that? Well, how do you look at the fact that there is dramatic pressure on pharma and biotech from a reimbursement point of view? And uh, should uh, we worry going forward? Well, well, <clears throat> well, one thing that stood out for me in the last 12 months, even in this period of macro pressure on the biotech sector, has been that the pharma, big pharma companies are cash rich, and they recognize that they've got, I think, 40 or half the revenues going off patent by the end of the decade. And so they look to the smaller companies, to the venture capital universe, as well as the the plethora of public companies to make those to to provide that innovation. I was, you know, you see companies like BioHaven and Seattle Genetics, Horizon, Prometheus recently, uh, Chemocentrics, Iveric, uh, Bellus Health. They've all been acquired for seventy to one hundred percent premiums relative to their valuation in the market in the last twelve months. So. I guess my point here is the industry recognizes the, the fundamental importance of innovation and is willing to pay up for it, uh, particularly in the context of the, the uns uncertainty around reimbursement globally. The only way you can do that is to, is to, is to have an honest, honest discussion with the pairs. And you know, this is what it's going to cost without the innovation. And, and, and if, if we can provide, keep people out of the hospital, we can move people towards cures, that is going to save a lot of money and, and, and alleviate a lot of suffering. And I think I'm still a believer that while we go through moments um, of, of irrational behavior, like maybe some elements of the IRA, I think in the longer term, uh, societies uh, are going to do the right thing. And that, and that I, I think that uh, the truth will prevail. And I think, you know, there's, there's no easy easy way around here. I think the point that was made earlier is well taken. Having, having the 10th or the 15th PD-1, that's, that's a real questionable investment. But having a novel drug that's really improving activities of daily living 
in a dramatic way like you've never seen before in Alzheimer's disease, that, that is really important. And when you go to the earlier stage patients, uh, that could have a dramatically positive impact in improving elderly people's lives. So the truth in my mind, I think it's just getting closer to the truth. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Rajiv. And, you know, we, we forget the fact that uh, about uh, uh, 40 plus percent of uh, people who reach the age of 85 are going to have Alzheimer's, which also by 2026 would all by itself bankrupt our healthcare system in just taking care of them. So we do need to do things in a dramatic way, but for innovation. So Steve, how do you choose between something that's really important or something that all of your colleagues are investing in and you're investing in also? Well, I, I, I think it comes back to something Rajiv was just touching on. I mean, what is going to be a fundamental um, uh, improvement for patients? Um, and and then sometimes uh, if uh, if you're able to to be fortunate enough to figure out a great target, um, then you have a lot more confidence. I think that sometimes, and this is where I would um, I, I really have applauded Biogen over the years. Um, certainly, what we thought about when we started Denali, um, there are areas where you have to just you have to collect a lot of money and. <laughs> You have to start picking apart the targets. You're going to have to find the targets on your own. You can't, um, uh, for neurodegenerative disease, uh, you can't just rely on what's happening in academia and get lucky. Um, I, I'm just as a side note, um, maybe to add a little, uh, maybe be a little bit of a uh, 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 provocateur. I, I and, and I'd have to disclaim everything by saying I'm a great friend of of Al Sandrock. I think the original. I had no problem with the uh, uh, approval of aducanumab. I actually think the real sin was in the pricing. Um, and, and I was alone in our, I mean, our, our, most of our group for, for the record was against the approval. But um, I think that there is a reason why um, regulatory agencies should for, as Chris was pointing out, for diseases in which there is nothing and you can't give patients anything, we have to actually follow those patients with something that is incremental. and But it has to be priced appropriately. If you're not curing someone, and I agree with you, Sam, I, I, I think that these are, this is, this is the first break in the wall. It's not, uh, these are not answers, um, but they are, they're the first hope that these patients have had. And I'd like to follow these patients, but you can't expect you can't society expect to a lot. As a final note, um, I would agree with you. I mean, I'm also old enough, Sam, that when Charlie Janeway taught immunology for, to me, it was still just T cells and B cells. But one thing that we've learned over you know, the pandemic is just how miraculous the immune system is. And figuring out how to program this particular system um, is going to be one of the big areas. And it's certainly an area that we're, we're very interested in um, at this point. So. Well, I, I fully agree with you. And Charlie and I collaborated when he was at the NIH before he went to Yale to teach you. So I love that. I'm going to uh, uh, ask Daphne a question before I do, because of the technical difficulties that are going on with our Chinese colleague. I just want to say that uh, uh, Teresa says uh, uh, area where she's moving forward is trying to become a global company. And Sinobiopharmaceuticals is trying to do things in innovative areas. Uh, full disclosure, uh, uh, they even are uh, working with me on Rock 2. But what she is doing is doing things like she, they just bought a company in England, uh, F-Star. So uh, I think they were confused and probably thought they were buying Steve Knight. But it wasn't F-Prime, it was F-Star. And uh, so it was in a, a different area of bifunctional antibodies. And they bought a delivery company in uh, Belgium. So Chinese companies are going to move and the world will change. They won't just do me too. They'll start to get innovative. And that brings me back to Daphne for a moment, because Daphne has always been someone who has worked not 
in one area, a single uh, 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 drug, a single CAR T, a single uh, 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 KRAS uh, a mutant inhibitor. Um, and Daphne, you get uh, uh, two different points of view, but what's your point of view on how to uh, uh, develop these programs in a more prolific fashion? Daphne, you're on silent or I can't hear you. Sorry, one of the things that strikes me about this industry is that there's certain things that are accepted um, and are in, you know, in fashion or broadly accepted and people don't really question them. And one of those is this preference towards single asset or th single therapeutic area companies. And I think this may be because the investors like diversifying their portfolios um, themselves and single asset companies make it easy for them to focus on what they're investing in. Um, there's also a perception that single asset companies make better M&A targets. But I'd like to make the case for companies with broader pipelines, a little bit more diversification. And I believe they have their own advantages in that they mitigate binary risk and the management incentives are aligned with shareholders in terms of prioritizing the winners. So there's less incentive to continue a program that has mixed results. And it's frankly a more efficient way to develop new medicines because there's on off times uh, when you're developing new drugs. I'm also not sure from an M&A perspective that diversification is less attractive because, you know, if you look across the top 15 pharma companies, they have on average seven therapeutic areas. And there's certain ones like oncology, immunology and neuro CNS, which are common in many of the top pharma. So I would just throw it back to you, Sam. You know, what do you think about this concept that, you know, diversified pipelines in biotech are less attractive? Yeah, well, so I've always lived in a world where uh, I've had more than one drug that I can work on at the same time. I just live in a world where everything I pick is always good. So that's the only difference between me and, and the rest of the world. And uh, see, I made, I, I do these things to make some of my colleagues smile, but it, it, it's true. Uh, so I, I think, interestingly, you're absolutely spot on, and I think that's that's quite important. Look, Biogen, as uh, Chris said, is this you know uh, blend between a startup and and, and a, a large pharma. They have more than one program, and and Chris can move more than one thing along at the same time. So Sam, I, would, I would just I would just add a yeah. thought on that, and I would say that you know I think. The, the sort of traditional view of thinking about therapeutic classes, I wonder if it's less becoming less and less relevant. I understand the commercial sides of it, but it just feels like as you grow towards atomic level resolution, and you've had this journey in the last 30 years from replacing proteins to blocking proteins to now getting into the cellular machinery in a deeper level, it, it you know, you're starting to figure out some of these fundamental principles of how cells work and how they regenerate and how they communicate. And so, and, and you've got, you know, machine learning that can enable those, these processes. It, I just wonder if, if in the next period, it's going to be more about solving the problems uh, on a more, you know, not in, that, not in the traditional way. Right. No, I, I good. I, I, you were uh, turning like sideways. Too. I mean, you, you get to some no, fundamental no. <laughs> nodes in the network. I, I think I might have got cut off there, but you get to some fundamental nodes in the network and, and it has broad, broad applications. And, you know, you've seen the overlap in immunology and oncology and, and it, it's, you can't really think about therapeutic classes anymore in my mind. If you really, I, if you really want to figure out breakthroughs. Yep. I totally agree with you. Um, I think that more and more now, you know, we had uh, Erwin Schrodinger, even before Steve Knight was born, um, talking about uh, genetic code for the first time in his book, What is Life? And I must say uh, that was before DNA, and it turned out that DNA was very important. I am now a firm believer that DNA is informational and all of uh, the genetic codes important. But what happens sequentially, like the cytoskeleton of a cell movement, uh, uh, plasticity of the immune system, uh, more important. And we're now learning that and we're learning how to intervene in things 
that we never thought we could do before. So I fully agree. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Chris, I think, uh, are we down to the last moment? What's our time right now? We got four minutes, Sam. Four minutes. Okay, so perfect. I'd like all of us, and I'll start with Chris, to tell us what the world's going to be like uh, uh, two years from now. What world are we going to be looking at uh, uh, in two years? We've got a world outside of our industry that looks like it's ready to go to shit any moment. So that world I, I'm really worried about. But I agree that innovation is exploding. So what's our world going to look like in the next two years, all of you? Uh, you know, two, two years is tomorrow, Sam. I always say, actually, tomorrow is three years in this industry. Uh, uh, you know, I think. Fair enough. Looking at Tell me what's going to happen. I agree. What's going to happen in the next three to five years? Uh, you know, I, 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 I first, I would certainly echo what Rajiv has said about the therapeutic classes. Uh, you know, it's Elia Sohoni that said, you know, we describe too many diseases by their symptoms or where we find a tumor, not by their cause. And and I think, um, you know, we are certainly moving towards that, as, as, as Rajiv has said. You know, I think um, I think there is going to be first on the biotech side. You know, I, I don't see the financial markets really changing all that much. The, the higher interest rates are, are, are here to stay for a while anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we were in a world where there was too much money chasing too few opportunities and, and a number of opportunities got financed that shouldn't have been. And I think we're going to first on the biotech side. Um, see an awful lot more uh, need to have evidence and and uh, clear data to justify financing, um, but it is going to stay challenging. Um, and I think we're going to have to keep a careful eye on on the political situation. The IRA is is going to have a definite impact on how much gets spent, uh, and we as an industry have to be extremely uh, vigilant in making sure that the situation doesn't get worse, which means really. Um, ensuring that the value proposition of our industry is 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 broadly and, and widely understood. Well, I think that's great. I'm going to uh, uh, say what uh, Sinobiopharmaceuticals Chairwoman Teresa Tsai would have said three to five years from now. There are going to be some real global Chinese players. I look at that with some trepidation, but I think that's going to be real. And uh, uh, it's going to be done via acquisitions of what? biotech. So Daphne, what's going to happen three to five years from now? I think one area where there's going to be, um, there's opportunity for a lot of innovation is clinical trials. And there's been concepts like decentralized clinical trials that have been talked about and done for years, but some new tools, new technologies for remote uh, monitoring and remote follow-up with patients. Um, and just, I think there's going to be things like vo vocal biomarkers uh, really are going to change uh, the landscape for decentralized clinical trials and clinical trials in general. Cool. I have uh, uh, forgotten, and I, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to use the fact that uh, Rajiv kind of told us already uh, what was going to happen, as did Steve. And I'm going to go to uh, uh, Simone of, of BioCentury to ask a quick question. And then I have to uh, ask Ajay from Lazard to ask a question, or I will be beaten by uh, uh, Karun uh, when he sees me next, which I do not want. So Simone, ask a question of anyone you want. Yeah, uh, well, actually, I'm going to sort of ask everybody, and a couple of you have raised the IRA, and I'm interested to know to what degree that is going to create an inflection point. You think that that will create an inflection point in the how the industry develops, um, how you, you know, for example, changing investments, portfolio prioritization or deal valuations right now, um, or do you just think the industry is going to adapt? Well, I, I'll start. I, I think the industry ultimately has always adapted, but I, uh, there's no question that the, the, the cost of developing drugs keeps going up and the IRA uh, shrinks the returns that you're going to get from that investment. So 
you, you know, I think the willingness to invest in, in healthcare innovation is, is under threat. Um, and that's where, you know, as Daphne pointed out, we're going to have to get more efficient on things like clinical trials, and we're going to have to up the ante on, on, on innovation. Uh, I do think uh, with the IRA, um, you know, some of this duplicative research uh, and development goes away. Um, and, and there will be some changes. There's, you know, there is a clear bias uh, in favor of biologics over small molecules, and that's playing out. It's uh, the, the idea of developing a small indication first to de-risk and then go after the larger indication is a strategy that's also uh, dead. So, so there are going to be some changes. But I, I do think that uh, we have to do a better job of explaining the even the geopolitical importance, the, the competitiveness of, of countries um, um, that is so dependent upon innovation. And, and you know, short-term uh, measures to try to save cost puts uh, the long-term innovative capacity at risk. And we, ha we have to make sure that that doesn't, that, that doesn't come to pass. Yeah. Um, Ajay, All right. what's going on hey. in the banking world? <laughs> well, there's a lot going on in the banking world, topic for another discussion. But Sam, I, I, I know uh, Andy teased you at the start of the, uh, of the panel, but, uh, you know, people often say it's actually tougher to ask a good question than to give a good answer. You certainly have asked some very, very good questions. So compliments to you on that. I, I, I want to ask the following question. Steve, you mentioned earlier that this is going to be the century of life sciences, much like the previous one was the century of physics. And I totally agree. So here's my question. Hypothetically, uh, if each of you had a billion dollars, and I think for some of you, that's not a hypothetical question, where, which technology would you invest it in? Would you put it in? And you get to pick only one, and you get to answer only in three or four words, not a full essay. Would you put it in RNA? Would you put it in precision medicine? Would you, you actually go contrary and say, I think there's still a lot to do in, uh, in gene therapy or gene editing? Where would you, which technology would you invest a billion dollars in? Well, I, since we've probably already done that in gene editing and uh, gene therapy, I, as I indicated before, I would right now do it in immunology. And, and, and that's that's not saying much because that's just now a word. And I think as Rajiv has yeah. correctly pointed out, we're, we're talking about targets and pathways. But I think that understanding and deconvolving the complicated machinery in immunology and learning how to put it, how to put it properly is going right. to be a big By big the way, that, that's that I'm supposed to close out now, Steve, I happen to agree with you, but knowing how to use immunology is not easy. And I think I'm one of the few people who you know how to do that. So that's okay. So we're finishing up now. So thank you all. And thank you, Karun. Thank you. Can you put the poll slide, please? Question that we'll be polling over the next few minutes is, what do you most expect to see over the next year? A, capital markets will start to open by the end of the year. B, new company formation will plummet. C, the IRA overhang will cause companies to reconfigure their pipelines. Or D, two or more women will be appointed as CEO of major biopharma companies. There we go. So this one is a little bit more uh, distributed in terms of the answers. So the question after the investment outlook panel was, what do we expect to see most over the next year? And uh, I guess the number one answer that almost half had voted was the IRA overhang will cause companies to reconfigure their pipeline. Capital markets will start to open by the end of the year. So there's some optimism that comes out of that panel, um, but, but distributed answers. So terrific. So as always, thanks to the audience for, for participating.